I've been talking about marriage and just our journey, really our journey, our Christian journey, from the place of, of bondage to sin to the place of living in God's presence and in God's power and, and experiencing that in our daily life. And for the last few weeks, I've talked about marriage and we've talked about men and we've talked about women and, and you know, but I, I just felt like I need to stop and have a reset. And I will tell you this, Caleb will be preaching next Sunday. So you get a break from me. And I'm excited about what he's going to be preaching about. Caleb, I just, I know, I, unless he, unless God changes his mind, I know what he's going to preach about, or at least I know a little bit about what he's going to preach about. And I'm just telling you the same spirit that's working in me on this sermon is the same spirit that's working in you on your sermon, and they're going to go together like this. And I didn't mean for it to be that way. As a matter of fact, I knew what you were going to be preaching about next Sunday, Caleb, at least your subject matter, and I thought, I've got to be careful because I don't want to steal any of his thunder. Okay? Uh, talking, you know, because I, I, I knew that if I wasn't careful, I would preach probably the same thing that he's wanting to preach about next Sunday. And so anyway, I just, I just, want, I just needed to reset. Uh, and I, I feel like it's spirit-led uh, to do so. Because I know this, and if we don't, listen, I can talk about men, I can talk about women, I can talk about our journey, you know, through our Christian walk, I can talk about marriage, I can talk about parenting, I can talk about kids, I can talk about all that stuff. But here's the thing, if we don't put Christ first, none of that other stuff is going to measure up to anything. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm just telling you, listen, you will never be the Christian, you will never be the spouse, you will never be the parent, you'll never be whatever, you'll never be what you're supposed to be fully until you put Christ first. So I'm just saying this, I, I need to stop because we need to, I've been talking about God's order, God's order, and I know I've talked about this some, but if I can, if you just give me a moment, I, I want you to, I, I know I've talked about putting God first, but I'm telling you, we got to put him first and we got to get real about this thing of serving God. Is it to say I couldn't be a decent husband? Without putting Christ first, oh, I could be decent. I could be maybe good. Maybe I could be okay. Maybe I could be mediocre at best. But I will never be great without Christ. Amen? And when I say great, I am not talking about me being great as if I'm somebody. I'm talking about being a great husband, a great Christian, a great father, a great pastor, a great whatever. Listen, when I say great, again, I'm not talking about the, pride, the proud type of great. I'm talking about being everything God wants me to be, to be a power-filled, Holy Ghost-led child of God. That's why I'm talking about being great, okay? And that I'm allowing God to lead in every aspect uh, of my life. So um, anyway, that being said, I didn't know what else to title this sermon other than Awakening. We could go back through the history of, of North America or the United States, and we could look at, because even before the United States was the United States, there was a spiritual revival that took place in the 1700s prior to the Revolutionary War, and there's been a handful of other real spiritual revivals that swept through the population of this country uh, at different times. I'm not going to talk about all that today. I just, I, because when you think about awakening, you think about the great awakening, okay? Uh, it's just about revival. And I'm telling you, that's where we need to get. It's where I need to get. And when I say revival, I'm not talking about, you know, saying we come to church, wow, we had a really great service. I'm talking about we come to church, yeah, we had a really great service, but then I go out there and I live and I'm on fire for Jesus and I'm really doing what God wants me to do no matter what it costs, that Jesus is first, that he is everything to me, okay? So I may not be explaining that the best, but that's the direction uh, that I want to go this morning. If you would, uh, let's look here at Matthew. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to read some scripture before I sp speak anymore. I've spoken way more than I intended already. 
uh, but I want to read the Scripture first. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at three different passages of Scripture before we begin. Two of them are in Matthew. One of them is in Philippians. Matthew chapter 8. Oh, before I go any further, if I don't say it now, I will forget. Let me go ahead and get to the Scripture. Before I go any further, I just want to say, and I know that Paige has a, a, has a Bible school meeting that she's wanting to do after church, but I'm going to dismiss the service a little different today. Um, and I know that we normally take prayer requests and things, and I was going to do that before we got started here, but since we're already started, listen, just bear with me, okay? Um, I'm going to dismiss the service a little bit different today. Uh, I'm not going to dismiss in prayer. I want, you know, when we come to the end of this, of this message, uh, I just want, and we're just all going to stand, and I want you to, to, to focus and think about what God is saying to you, about what I have said, or what the Word of God has said to you, or what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And if you want to come forward, come forward, and, and we're going we're gonna to dismiss like that, okay? We're not going to have a dismissal prayer. Uh, I just want to give you freedom to allow God to do, because I feel like sometimes I, I have prayer over everybody, and that's all proper and good and, and, and well at times, but sometimes I feel like I do that, and it's like, all right, I'm done praying, so you're done praying, and, and we all, you, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so I want to give some liberty to that, and if you want to stay for the Bible school meeting, I don't want to take away from that, just hang around, hang around anybody that wants to, whatever, uh, you know, during that time. Uh, but if you want to stay for the Bible school meeting, just, you know, when you're up here praying, don't get in no hurry. They can have a meeting without you uh, or whatever. So uh, just, just saying, I just want it, to, I want it to be organic. I want it to be real. I want you to be able to connect with God as, as he speaks to you, okay? And uh, anyway, let's look at the scripture here. And let's do this before we begin. Let's have a word of prayer. I want you guys to pray for me. Uh, this morning, because I, I don't know how to deliver this message very well. So, dear God in heaven, we come before you today. We just want to thank you for your goodness and your grace. I do just give you praise, Father, for who you are and, and Lord, what you're doing uh, in our church. And I thank you for what you're doing, Lord, in our lives. And, and God, I do see you moving. And, and Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would move here once again this morning. God, I want to pray that, Lord, that those that are saved here would just have a deep connection. And, Lord, uh, just that the Spirit of God would move in us. And, and, Lord, show us what you want to show us this morning. And I pray that we will be willing to respond, Lord, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And it's calling on our life. And, God, I want to ask you, Jesus, if there's anyone here that's unsaved, Lord, I pray that the power and the presence of God would move in such a powerful way here this morning that they would, they would have a, a, a just see their need and have a, have a desire for Christ in their life. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit will move freely in this place, that it will not be hindered by anything or by any. Lord, I pray that there would be, Lord, that Satan would have no power over these people, Lord, over this church, over this service, over the decisions that will be made. And I pray in the name of Jesus when we leave here today that there will be people who are truly changed. And Lord, their lives turned upside down by the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, we love you and praise you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's look at the scripture this morning. I want to read these scriptures without speaking uh, much on them as far as I'm going to try not to interrupt myself as I normally do. Uh, but I want us to look at each one of these scriptures, and I hope that as you read them with me, that you will see a trend, okay? So Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 23, let me give you a little context to this before I start, or I will interrupt myself. Jesus is getting ready to go across the sea. They're getting ready to get in a boat, him and his followers, him and some of the disciples, and this young man comes running through the crowd. I can kind of visualize him coming, running. Wait, wait, wait. I need to talk to you, Jesus. And this young man comes up to Jesus and says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes, 
about him, he gave command to depart to the other side of the sea. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. I, I will follow you. So this guy comes running and says, Jesus, wait. I want to follow you. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now let me stop just for a moment and tell you this. When it says, let the dead bury their dead, what he's saying is, let me go home. His father had not died. He was saying, my father is old. I need to go home and be with him until he dies. So I can't follow you, Jesus, until I have put my father in the grave, okay, until he's dead. So I'm going to tend to him until his death. And Jesus says, we don't have time for that. Today is the day. Follow me now. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. What Jesus says to this, this scribe, he tells him, listen, you want to follow me? You're going to have to surrender all. He tells this guy about his dad, you want to follow me? You're going to have to put me first. You've got to surrender all. Now then, let's look at the next scripture. Jesus said unto him in Matthew chapter 19, another young man comes up to Jesus. This guy's a, 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 a ruler. He's wealthy. He comes to Jesus. We all know the story. Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this saying, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now we all know the story about the rich young ruler as we know him in, in Scripture, kind of the title that's been given to him. This guy wants to follow Jesus and Jesus has a conversation with him about his morals and, and about the law. And he says, oh, I've done all that stuff. I, I've, 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 blessed, I've been good to my neighbors. I, I've not stolen. I've not done all these things. I've kept these commandments. And Jesus says, there's one thing you haven't kept. And that is, go sell everything you got and follow me. In other words, Jesus is saying, you've broken the first commandment, really the first four commandments, and that is putting God first. You see, this young man had kept all the commandments about morality, but he forgot to put God first. You see, God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen? Commandment number one. This young man had a God before him. And it was his stuff, it was his money, it was his possessions. So Jesus tells him, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to surrender everything. You've got to put me first. Now then, let's look at the next scripture. Philippians 3, 7 through 10 says, But what things, I love this, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. And the Apostle Paul says about his life, remember, he was a ruler in the, in the synagogue. He was, a, he was an important Pharisee. Uh, he, he was educated. He had clout. I mean, listen, he had popularity. People knew who he was. He was a great man as far as the, you know, the people were concerned. Paul became a Christian. He was Saul before he was called Paul. He became a Christian, and after he became a Christian, he says this, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Listen, does that explain you and me? Is that a description of me? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is the law of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. Now then, before we go any further, I got ahead of myself there. Do you see the pattern? 
Do you see the pattern of, of being a true follower of Jesus? It takes surrender. Full, complete surrender. Putting Jesus first. Okay? I want you to keep that in mind. Now then, just some thoughts I had yesterday when I was thinking about this message. What will it take? What would it take for there to be an awakening or a, a what we would call a revival in our community? I thought, you know, I might say, well, in our country. I might say in our state. But I want to get a little more personal than that. Because it's really easy for me to look at Washington and say, hey, they need revival. Right? I mean, I, I can look at the political scene and say, oh, we need revival there. And that's true. There's nothing untrue about that. But I want you to know this. God wants us to be a little more personal because it's so easy for me to point over there when I really need to be pointing here. And I really need to be pointing here. Amen? In our church, in our lives, in my life, in my family, what is it going to take for there to be real revival in our community? A community where sin has such a strong grip. Where the moral values of our society, and I'm talking about our society, even here in rural Missouri, has declined to such an extent. Where addiction is sweeping like a plague through, through our young people. And not just young people, but adults. Where addiction is a, a, literally a plague in our community. What's it going to take for us to have revival in a community like that? Where families are being redefined and destroyed. What's it going to take? A community where young and old alike are growing increasingly cold and distant toward God. A community where there is a church on every corner. Let me rephrase that. I didn't write it down like this, but this is my thoughts. A community where there is a lukewarm, complacent church on every corner, of which we also, I would like to think at times, are one. I would like to think not all the time. When I say that, I'm talking not about you, I'm talking about me. Because I'm your pastor and I'm your preacher, and yet I preach oftentimes a lukewarm complacent gospel I want to preach a gospel with power that's what Paul says amen. amen that I may know him and the power of his resurrection that's what we need to know amen listen Paul said to one church he said I wouldn't know anything among you except for Christ and him crucified why because he said that's where the power is at the power is in the crucifixion. The power is in, in the resurrection. The power is in salvation. The power is in Jesus. I want to emphasize again, because it is a crying shame, that our community is in such a state as it is in when there is a church literally on every corner. Think about that. Just down this strip right here alone. Within five miles, there's three churches. That's, and, and I probably could drive around some of these gravel roads and find some more. Listen, I paint a bleak picture. But I want you to understand it's not one that is completely... I didn't know what other word to use... But it's not completely accurate. And the reason I say that is because I see signs in this church, and I want to give you some encouragement because I'm just, I've just slapped you around a little bit, but I want to pick you up. 
Uh, because, listen, I see signs of a movement of God in this church. Because in the last, just in the last, let me just say this, in the last few weeks alone, I've watched a bunch of men come up here and bow the knee before the throne of God. Now you might say, well, that's, you know, hey, listen, bow your knee all you want, but now you got to get up and go live it. I don't know how you guys have been doing on that. But I just know that God spoke to you and God moved you to bow yourselves before him. A whole lot of you. And I watched you women respond in the same way. And when I preached about the family for the first time, marriage, I watched you take your spouse's hand and come up here and bow before the throne of God. Listen, I see God moving. Grant and I had a conversation the other day. It didn't have anything to do with this sermon, but it goes along with it. Grant and I had a conversation the other day. We was thinking about our church, about church, and, and I don't know if he asked the question or if I asked the question. I said, how many people do you think in our church are truly passionate about God? Now, you might say, well, define passionate. I'm not going to take the time to do that. Maybe we'll preach on that sometime. But we, I will say this. I'm not going to call out names, okay? Because you're going to wonder, I wonder if I was on that list. <laughs> I will tell you this. I want to tell you all something. Because I want to confess my faults before you. I want you to understand something. And you say, well, you're just being hard on yourself. Listen, when I look at, my, when I look at Grant and I look at Bridget and I don't know exactly about Julie, but I think I could probably look at her too, but I, I don't live with Grant anymore, but he's in my shop every single day, right? We work together. And I look at them, and I look at their love and their passion for the Word of God. I did not put myself on that list. I didn't tell him that. But when I look at myself compared to them, I, 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 don't, I didn't put myself on there. And I thought, and, and here's the deal. So if you think, well, I didn't make, maybe I wonder if I made the list. I didn't. And I mean it. But a lot of you did. Listen, I, I look at what God is doing and people like Caleb. I'm going to give Caleb the great big head. But I look at Caleb and I look at his passion for Jesus. Now, he doesn't see it this way, and I know he doesn't, but I'm telling you, I look at him and I see the passion for Jesus in him, and I think he's only been saved for just a little over, about a year and a half, and I think, man, look what God is doing, okay? So I just want you all to understand that God is working, and I am not missing that, and not only that, but I know in the last few weeks, and I know putting this, thinking about this sermon, what I was going to say today, I know what I feel in my spirit. And it is a Holy Ghost burning and desire for revival. And God does not put that on anyone without having the intentions of wanting to do it. Amen? He's not going to make us do it. He's not going to make us be part of it. He'll use somebody else if we won't. Okay, God's not limited to me. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm limited. He's not. But I'm telling you this, God did not put it on my heart to preach this message for nothing. He's got something to say. Listen, this is this revival. This, when I think of revival, it's not one that I can bring. It's not one that can be planned by man's efforts. Every year we hear about people saying, well, we're going to have revival. Not if it's by your efforts, you won't. It'll be God and God alone that brings it. Amen. What is a revival? What is an awakening? I mean, we could spend a lot of time on this, and I didn't want to preach a long time this morning. But to me, it is a complete turning away from sin 
and a complete surrender to God by those who receive it. What I mean by that is, listen, it is when God speaks, God moves, God puts it in your heart that I need to make a move for God and you completely turn your life around away from yourself, away from the sin that's in your life, and you turn completely to God. Revival will never happen until God's people repent and turn completely to God. Amen? It just won't happen. It always involves repentance. And it always involves a turning to God for complete dependence. Not just that you want to be friends or that you want to be a fan of His, but that you are going to get in the game and you're going to do whatever it takes. You're going to do whatever He asks and you're going to allow Him to be Lord in your life. The book of Acts, I didn't put the scripture up, but in the book of Acts chapter 2, we see the first real awakening. You say, well, that's when Christianity was born. That's true. It's when the Spirit of God came and people got saved. And, and, but here I want you to think about this. In Acts chapter 2, you can read the account over there about what happened to the people and... <clears throat> The disciples, the apostles were gathered together. There was 120 disciples in a room and they were gathered together and they were praying. Key number one, right? And the Spirit of God fell on those men. And some of them got up and began to preach. And the people that were around them were of all different nations and tongues and they began to hear in, in their own tongue. And they begin to hear this message that these men begin to preach. And they were preaching the, 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 they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus. They were preaching Jesus. And at the end of that sermon, they asked Peter, what do we do? What do we do? Listen, and they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they became Christians. 3,000 of them, 3,000 of them believed in Jesus on that day. Now, the story does not stop there. And the story should not stop here. My point being is when the Spirit of God moves, lives get changed. When the Spirit of God moves, people get saved. Not everybody don't get me wrong, but when the Spirit of God moves, people get saved. When the Spirit of God's move, God moves, God's people are changed. Lives are turned around, revolutionized, if you will. The Bible tells us over there in that account in the book of Acts that 3,000 people believed in Jesus and were baptized and and these people, they, if you read on in the chapter, you'll find that they begin to gather together. They took everything that they had. And here's the deal. Are, am I telling you you've got to sell everything you got if God requires it? But that's not what I'm preaching about this morning. I'm not telling you you've got to do that. I don't feel like God's leading me to do that. But what God is saying here, listen, they took everything they had and they began to sell it and distribute it among themselves. Point being is they were putting Christ first. Their stuff now meant nothing. And when they begin to put Christ first and they begin to get together and they begin to pray together, eat together, pre preach together, learn the word of God together in their, you know, in, in groups here and there. Listen, Christianity spread like fire. How? Why? Why? Because listen, when, you, when God gets a hold of your heart, and I mean he really gets a hold of your heart, I've been thinking about this the last couple weeks. What's real revival look like? Well, it manifests itself in this way. When God gets a hold of my heart, and I mean really gets a hold of it, I can't keep it to myself. You know what's caused great awakenings in this country in the past? 
It's when the Spirit of God unexpectedly moved in a, in a, in a, in a service or in a you know, gathering or whatever, maybe moved upon a preacher and he preached a, a message and then the whole city was lit up with the fire of God. And what happened to those people is they couldn't keep it to themselves. They were going to their neighbors and saying, you got to come down here. you got to see what this is about. I've, you got to meet this Jesus. Man, I'm going to tell you something. If I could really get a hold of who Jesus is, I couldn't keep him to myself. Man, I'd have to share it with somebody. I want us to look at one more passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. This is what Paul says to the Roman church. And knowing that the time that it is now, now it is high time. It is time. Listen, he said, it's a, if I can paraphrase here, it is about time. Amen. That we wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation. Now is the return of our Lord nearer than what we believed. Listen to me, time will run out someday. Amen? Amen? Time will be up one day, and it is closer than you think. No matter when that time is, it is closer than you think. He says the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness. In other words, let us throw off this sin that Paul says in Hebrews, the weights and the sin that do so easily beset us. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And let us begin, let us walk honestly as, as in the day and not rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What's he saying? He's saying the exact same thing that I have already said. Turn away from yourself, turn away from sin, and turn to God. You want revival? How many of y'all want revival to come in our community? Amen. Let me tell you something. Don't look out there for it. Look right here. Look right here. It starts with me. It starts with you. It starts right now. Paul says, hey, it's about time that you all wake up and get up out of your bed and start doing the right thing. Amen? Amen. If we're not going to do that, if we're not going to do that, we might as well forget it. We're just wasting our time. I want to ask you today, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me. Again, remember, we're just going to dismiss a little different this morning. If you're here, I want, I want you to give me a moment. Okay, I want you to give me a moment. I want you to give me a moment just to, to give yourself a moment. To allow God's Spirit to speak to you. And I, wanna, I want you to bow your heads with me. I want you to close your eyes. I want me looking around just for a minute. So let me talk.